Thank you very much. Um, is the human body an appropriate place for a microchip? Um, well, given the problem that we've just seen with a simple clicker, I think the answer is no. So I'm going to wrap my talk up there. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, many people um, actually find it surprising that this question um, isn't hypothetical. Complex computing devices are routinely implanted into the human body every day. Perhaps the, the more interesting question is, can we enhance our body by implanting technology into it? For um, about 12 years, I've been a researcher at the University of Reading, and I've been investigating the topic of um, human implants and, and the potential of this technology. Um, as an engineer, I'm predominantly uh, interested in, in the technical possibilities, but more recently, I've come to realize that the technology actually fits into, um, into a bigger picture, and this bigger picture actually has the potential to change the very essence of what it is to be human. So what is it that we're talking about exactly? Well, in the first instance, uh, medical implants. Uh, implantable med medical devices like uh, cochlear implants and heart pacemakers and insulin pumps, devices which are designed to restore lost functionality. Um, these devices um, form very intimate connections between the biology of the body and the, the silicon of technology. Um, some of these devices perhaps are, are less familiar, cross your fingers. So this is um, a deep brain stimulator, and a deep brain stimulation involves implanting electrodes into the center of the brain and actually stimulating part of the brain to stop it from malfunctioning. So the electrodes are invasively inserted a wire is tunneled under the skin down to a, a pacemaker type unit that's uh, located in the chest. Uh, this type of technology is applied for uh, several neurological disorders. Um, one particular um, application is the uh, tremor uh, associated with Parkinson's disease. Um, we can actually use brain stimulation to completely control this type of, of tremor. Here we have a patient who's got a very pronounced right-hand side tremor. This patient has already undergone the procedure to have the electrodes inserted in the brain and has the pacemaker unit uh, implanted into the chest. What we'll see him do is wirelessly turn on the implanted device in the chest so it starts to stimulate the brain. What we should see is almost immediately the tremor completely subsides. And what we see is essentially it appears that there's nothing wrong with them at all. There's no tremor whatsoever. So this is a highly effective technology, and it works by an intimate interface between technology and the brain, manipulating the brain. So this type of um, implant has been actually used in a clinical setting for, for many years and many thousands of these devices are implanted into people every year. Uh, in the last few years, we've been investigating a, a more intelligent version of this technology, so a device which actually monitors the brain activity and more intelligently stimulates the brain to control the disorder. So this is all uh, well and good for um, people with some sort of neurological disorder, but what about implants for healthy people? Well. In 1998, we did a series of experiments implanting RFID into uh, humans. RFID technology is probably uh, most commonly known for the identifying type tag that uh, are inserted into animals. Uh, at the time, we were interested in using this technology to allow people to access our building without using a smart card or without using a key. Instead, the building could actually identify the person by the implant that they had in their body. Since we did that work, many people around the world have had RFID implanted into their body. Um, the applications that they use uh, the technology for are very similar, accessing their house or starting their car or um, gaining access to their computer. Interestingly, these people aren't scientists, they aren't researchers, they're just everyday people who have seen a technology that they think is, is useful, 
and they've decided to undergo a procedure to, to have an implant. And I think that's an important distinction to make there. In uh, 2009, I had my own RFID implant inserted into my hand, which I still have. Um, this was actually using the latest generation of RFID technology. So rather than just being a identifier device, it actually is more like a tiny implantable computer. It's capable of doing very simple computations and storing information, storing data on the chip. What we were able to show with this technology was how we could infect it with a computer virus and then the implant could infect other devices with that virus just by talking to them. So I guess that leads to the question, why on earth would we do that? Well, th there's two main reasons. The first is we're very interested in the security of medical devices. A lot of um, implantable medical devices have no access control, they have no security. So if you know how to talk to them, then it's possible to gain access and turn them off, turn them on, or manipulate their settings. Um, at the time, we were, we were criticized for um, mentioning security in relation to medical devices because a lot of people felt that it wasn't really actually a problem. But since that time, many other uh, institutions have actually identified some uh, real security problems um, associated with specific commercially available uh, medical devices. So this is obviously a very serious problem and it does need um, to be uh, addressed. The other area that we're interested in is the personal experience, the psychology of having an implant. Many people that have medical implants have commented that it's, it's very different having an implant um, a technology permanently attached to your body is very different from having uh, a phone that you use or a computer that you use. Um, what we tend to find is these people actually feel that the technology becomes part of their body, or rather what they understand to be their body extends to incorporate the technology. In the area of prosthetics, this is um, an effect that we actually want to achieve. So if we give someone a, a prosthetic arm, for example, what we want is for them to feel that the, um, the arm is actually part of their body. We want them to interact with it in a natural way. And we find that that effect is, is possible to achieve. So perhaps it's not surprising that people with other implantable technologies feel the same sort of phenomenon. Certainly with the implant that I have, it's something that I use every day, I use in an entirely seamless way. I don't need to think about whether I've got it, I don't need to think about um, whether it works or whether it's charged. It's just something that's there, much like the rest of my body, I just use it, I don't need to think about it. Um, and I think this is a, a very important distinction to make. So, in the case of um, infecting a device with a, a virus, for example, or in the case of attacking, maliciously attacking a medical device, um, really we should be thinking about it in a very different way. To attack the device really is to attack the body of the person. And at that point, this distinction really is very important. So where does that actually leave us with enhancement? What does this all actually mean for human enhancement? Well. I think what we're likely to see is enhancement happening on two different levels. The first is medical devices which give the, the patient functionality, which actually far outstrips the functionality that it's designed to replace. So imagine, for example, um, a cochlear implant which gives the user superhuman hearing, or um, a retinal implant which gives a blind person vision, but overlays it with extra bits of information. This is clearly an enhancement and there's absolutely no reason why we shouldn't develop that technology. The second route is the redeployment of medical technology for healthy people. Um, imagine, well consider how we're communicating now. Our bodies are extremely limited. I have to take these complex thoughts and ideas 
convert them into words and then send them out in this serial stream that you have to listen to and then try and interpret what I mean. It's an extremely inefficient way of communicating. Or imagine how I interact with a computer. A very capable biological brain is interacting with a very capable computation uh, device by me sitting there and prodding a, a keyboard to get it to do what I want it to do. This is hugely inefficient. Imagine medical technology could give us an implant in the brain which allowed us to communicate directly brain to brain or uh, enabled information to be fed straight to us depending on what we're doing or um, the information that we need. Surely this is something that's extremely beneficial. Uh, in 2002, we did a series of experiments uh, invasively uh, attaching the nervous system of humans to computers. And we showed it was possible to form a very rudimentary level of communication between the nervous systems of two people. Equally, Anecdotal evidence from people with deep brain stimulators has shown that it's possible for us to enhance um, abstract features of the brain, uh, in one particular case, creativity. Also consider how technology has changed in the last 50 years. Certainly, all these elements combined, I don't think this is a technology, I don't think these are po possibilities that we can easily dismiss. Um, equally, Cosmetic surgery has shown us that people will undergo extremely uh, invasive procedures. And we already have technologies like the mobile phone, for example, which I would argue is not optional. It's not possible to interact in society in a meaningful way by uh, not having a mobile phone. I think human implants are likely to go along a very similar route. It would be such a disadvantage to not have the implant, that it essentially becomes not optional. Now, it would be terrible of me to, to come here today and talk about these fantastic opportunities that the future holds without giving you the possibility to experience it for yourself. So if anyone fancies being on the receiving end of a particularly nasty looking needle, and you want your own RFID implant, then absolutely feel free to come up and, uh, and have one. <laughs> okay, maybe at the end. I don't think this one has a computer virus, by the way, if that's what was putting you off. So, already, people walk among us who have implanted technology in the body that they feel is part of them. Are these the cyborgs of science fiction? Well, yes, I believe they are. Um, and I believe there's a very good chance that in the future, you may become one of them too. Thank you very much.